Church, pray with me this morning. Father God, praise, praise your name. Praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, Lord, three in one. Father God, as we hear these words that you are a playful and creative God this morning, let us praise and rejoice in that side of who you are. For you are a great and creative God who enjoys beautiful things and loves us even when we're not beautiful in your eyes. Lord God, for you are good and great and holy. And as we come before you today, let us hear your words and hear the words that you will speak through Pastor Abby. Let us hear and hear these words. than I usually sing, which is okay. Welcome again to Sunday service. We are so glad you are here. My name is Liz. Uh, I'm one of the worship leaders here at High Rock. Um, and at this time, we would love for you to turn and greet your neighbor, say hello, give a fist bump, a hug, if you're careful, um, and welcome to our service. We're so glad you're here this morning. Hello, good morning everybody, please be seated. Uh, as we get seated, um, we would love to invite our kids to Kids Rock. They're all, they're getting ready, they're getting ready. Uh, so during the summer, we're giving the teachers a little bit of a break, so we're consolidating Kids Rock classes. Um, all ages, both pebbles and gems, um, they are welcome to go together as a group to the playground, uh, weather permitting. Uh, and they're also welcome to stay in service if they wish, and there are some activities over there if they um, kind of want to stay, you know, playful, playful during the service. So as you go off to the playground, I think I see folks heading in that direction, uh, we play, pray a blessing over them. May they come to know how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God. Um, so as they go to the playground, I hope you all put your sunscreen on. Woo! 
Uh, the sermon is about play. So as they actually get to go and play, um, we're going to be hearing in a little bit from Pastor Abby Rice about um, our bodies and how we were created to play. But that's a teaser for a little bit later. Friends, it is good to be with you. We believe that whether you're new or whether you've been with us for a long time, um, we believe that God has something for us today, you and me um, and every one of us. My name is Pastor Kat. Uh, I serve here at High Rock Brookline. And whether you are with us in person or whether you are watching on the live stream, hello, folks, uh, it is an honor to be with you. And I know we might be coming from a lot of different places, and I'm, I'm grateful for that song that uh, Abby, uh, not Abby, um, that Liz and Elizabeth played for us, Your Grace is Enough. And, and I hope that that would, be, um, that would be the truth that we allow ourselves to rest in today, that the grace of God is enough. It is enough for today. It is enough for this moment. It is enough for this week. It is enough for this month. It is enough. And it's not just enough. It's overflowing. Like we can't hold all of it for ourselves. So we pray that we would know the overflowing and enough grace of God. So if that means we need to take a big deep breath, I know I do, settle in, uh, know that you are loved in the presence of God. Uh, as we seek to love God and one another more fully, I invite you to do that now. If you are new, uh, we especially want to extend a special welcome to you. Your presence is a blessing to us. We are glad you are here. Uh, please fill out a paper connection card so we can get to know you better, or you can fill one out online at the QR code. If you scan that with your phone, um, you'll get taken to the online connection card where you can fill it out online. If you have questions uh, or need directions, feel free to come and ask your neighbor. We would love to help you out. A few of our folks will also stick around uh, up front after the service if you would like to connect further, if you have questions, um, we'd be glad to meet you. As I said before, uh, we believe that us being gathered here today is not an accident, but that God has called you and me here uh, to be, to be transformed, to be transformed as we connect to God personally, um, as we connect to God's people, and as we connect to God's purposes um, by embodying God's love and life wherever we go. We call these our three connectings, and it's part of everything we do at High Rock. So I'm going to share a few announcements of what's going on, but know that the three connectings are part of the things of everything we do. Uh, this Tuesday, well, every Tuesday in the month of July, uh, I'm leading an open Bible study and discussion group. Um, come one week, come all weeks, uh, or just come whenever you're in town. Everyone's welcome. Uh, no prior experience with studying the Bible is needed. Just come as you are. We're going to have a fun time. We're going to have a fun time kind of digging in, exploring the Gospel of John. We'll meet in the church office, which is about a block and a bit a walk away, uh, on Tuesday evenings for study, reflection, and fellowship. Come find me if you have questions. On Wednesday, there is the follow-up members meeting to the one we had at the end of June. And this is the last opportunity to cast a vote um, as a congregation on kind of the direction of uh, High Rock Brookline in its transitions. Um, it's the last opportunity to cast a vote before the voting window closes. So we'll be um, kind of counting the results together, praying over it, and announcing it during that meeting. So um, if you have a question about it, if you're a member, we, we, we strongly encourage you to come out for this um, as we discern next steps together. Uh, this announcement and other announcements are in our weekly newsletter. To sign up for our newsletter, to get on the mailing list, um, you can tick the box on your connection card or email hello at highrockbrookline.org. Yes, my son is telling me that I need my coffee. That's true. Uh, <laughs> our Slack community board is another way to get plugged into the life of, of our community. We use Slack to coordinate um, things from... God's grace is enough, but iced coffee... I, I need that as well. <clears throat> uh, we use Slack to coordinate everything from hangouts and lunches, um, book discussions, and sometimes like pickup games uh, and, and, po and, and strategizing for Pokemon Go. I also know that. Um, the link to join our Slack is at the bottom of our email newsletter every week. Um, so now I invite my sister Karen to share the prayer for illumination and the reading of scripture as we open our hearts and minds to what God is speaking to us through his word. 
Good morning. My name is Karen. Um, as we move to engage with scripture and the sermon, please join me as we pray, asking God to eliminate the truth we encounter in the scriptures. Please stand as you are able. The words are on the screen behind me. Let us pray together. God, our creator, savior, and sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the God who does not change, and your goodness endures forever. As we open and hear your word today, help us to know who you are and who we are. Open our eyes so that we might see your ways, engage our minds so that we might understand your ways, and soften our hearts so that we might love your ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Today's reading from the Word of God comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. Please follow along in your own Bibles or Bible apps, Genesis 1, 26 to 29. Hear the Word of the Lord. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this week, we will be taking a break from our regular sermon series, and we're honored to have Pastor Abby Rice as our guest preacher this Sunday. Uh, Abby leads the High Rock Online Congregation, and she creates discipleship resources for um, the many High Rock congregations. And so uh, we're so glad to have her today. A little bit more about her. Uh, this Her bio was also in the newsletter, but I'm sharing it here. She is originally from this Boston metro area. She lives locally with her husband, Scott. She has two daughters. Um, she has a degree in English from Ithaca College, and she has experience working in both nonprofit and corporate sectors. Uh, she's been serving in ministry in various capacities uh, for the last 15 years. And what I love about Abby uh, and what I really admire about her is that she feels at home walking with people who are deconstructing and reconstructing their faith and wondering with about, like, how do how do how does my identity how does all of who I am fit with following Jesus? Um, and so she is not afraid of tough questions, of hard questions. She loves diving into those conversations because they matter, and the people who are asking them matter. As I said before, she serves at High Rock through leading the online congregation. She creates small group resources. She equips leaders. Um, and she's part of the adult discipleship team uh, with High Rock, High Rock to, to, to think about what it means to follow Jesus and to be the church in 2020, 2022 and into the next decade. She is a uh, Master of Theology student and uh, Master of Theology and Ministry student at Boston College. Uh, she enjoys listening to Yo-Yo Ma. She loves cheesy jokes. And her bio says she loves wild weather, and that's a little bit like, what? Maybe you can ask her about it. But it, either, anyway, um, we are so happy to have Abby here with us, and we pray that we have ears to hear what God is speaking in and through her. Thanks, Abby. Thank you so much, Pastor Kat, for that incredibly warm welcome. Um, I really do love wild weather, like watching a storm roll in. So you can ask me more about that. Excuse me. For sure. All right. Here's a little dance. There we go. So as Pastor Kat said, um, I've worked with High Rock Online, and it's 
wonderful to be like in the physical presence with people and not just like exist. I'm like not a hologram. Um, I've been at High Rock for at least eight years at this point. Um, I live in Arlington, so just up the way. And this summer, and today is one of those days, um, my husband and I are just trying to find creative ways um, to not let the heat and humidity absolutely steal our joy. Um, summer is historically not my favorite time of the year, and I pretty much melt in the heat. Um, that might not be shocking if you were to look at me. And I admit that a day at the beach sounds like a really unfun idea. A friend from the Cape tried to convince me otherwise um, by inviting me to the beach club that she belongs to. And yes, having a snack bar and really convenient parking and beach umbrellas did really warm me up to the idea. But I was still hot and sandy, and I was too cold in the water or too hot out of the water. I get why it's fun, but it just isn't easy fun for me. I do like the beach, but I really, really prefer a fall trip to the beach to collect seashells or even a winter trip to the beach off season is the best season. And if you live locally, you know that any of the beaches off season is absolutely the best season. That's a block of ice on the beach. My husband's standing on one because we went in February. It was gorgeous and uncrowded. The ample free parking is very fun. I can tell it's much more fun because I feel so much more relaxed in my body. I'm not filled with tension worrying about all the details. And in summertime, we're almost expected to be more playful when that can feel like the furthest thing from reality. It's summertime, but the living ain't easy, breezy, and beautiful just because the weather's warm. Work and grown-up responsibilities don't stop and are piled up waiting for you even if you do get a chance to get away. If you checked in with your body right now, do you notice your ear, like your shoulders up at your ears? Or maybe you're carrying tension in your jaw in your neck, maybe your back. Today, I wanna to talk about what it means to allow our bodies to be a way we hear from God, which is, I know, part of what you're thinking about this summer. The tension in our bodies becomes so commonplace that it's the new normal, and we've turned it out. For those who've already taken Advil today, I see you, and same. Can this invitation, can this tension be an invitation to rest? Like, not theoretically, because we know we should, but as an invitation from God to remember that you are God's sacred creation. In the summer, kids get to play. Many of them are at the playground right now. And honestly, when I heard that's what they were doing, I was like, all right, forget this, let's go. We're all gonna go to the playground. Because kids, they run their bodies hard. They get sweaty and dirty and red-cheeked and full of smiles, and then they chug water with two hands because they're so exhausted. Can you remember the last time your body was filled with that kind of freedom? Or recall a recent time when you felt that playful. I want to give you an opportunity now, before we kind of get going any farther, to chat with those around you for about two minutes about these questions that will be on the screen. What is one happy memory? you have playing as a kid, and two, if you get there, do you take time to rest in your week, or what makes you realize that you need it, and maybe what gets in the way when you try to? So I want to give you two minutes to chat about that with your neighbor now, and then we'll come back together and I'll share a little bit more.
just take one more minute. It sounds like you all have a lot to talk about, and I hope that this is just the beginning of the conversations that you all have with each other. Perhaps this will be the basis for a conversation later with your friends or perhaps even with God. So maybe you're like me, and the classic examples of summer fun just cause you more stress right now. Or maybe you're sitting here thinking you would love to have the inconvenience of hauling a bunch of stuff to the beach, but work doesn't stop, and there's just too much to do, or it's expensive and beaches often aren't accessible. I thought that hearing from God through play would be easy. I have kids, so I'm always surrounded by playfulness, whether I decide to or not. So I decided to take some time to engage in something playful. Easy, right? Like, I get to play for sermon prep. I thought, this is great. But it was actually so much harder than I thought it would be. I realized how out of touch I was with how I, I enjoyed playing for my own sake, not just to entertain the kids. I'd become more like Roy Kent than Ted Lasso at this point. And it didn't just impact me. This became really clear when at the beginning of the pandemic, I was told by my daughter in absolutely no uncertain terms that baking with me was not fun. We did not do the sourdough thing. It was really a wake-up call. I wasn't passing along my love of baking to my daughter because I was being too controlling. I was determined then and there that one goal of the pandemic isolation was to make baking with me fun so that neither of us ended up in a meltdown. I had to channel the grace of Julia Child to sort of like chase out the Gordon Ramsay part of my attitude. My own body became tense in the kitchen and you can bet that made those around me tense too. So as I tried to figure out how to reacquaint myself with playing, many of the things I thought of just felt like more work to do and just another thing I had to do rather than something I was free to enjoy. I realized how I'd forgotten how to play or if I would even enjoy play. Would it just be a silly waste of time? The question of if I could be successful at playing, even that held me back. I am an absolute chronic overthinker, and my therapist does fantastic job security. So how about for you? If you were given eight hours to do something playful, would that feel like a gift, a burden, a waste of time? Even as staff, when we try to plan a fun all-staff gathering, Sometimes we call it forced family fun. Everyone has a very I, different idea of what fun is. One colleague of mine would love a group workshop where everyone could speak their minds and reconcile their differences, you know, to each their own. Your own pastor, Kat, when I asked her about this, she actually sounds like she should be preaching this sermon. These are a few things that she shared that she's enjoyed recently. Going to a World War I history museum doing a croissant crawl. You guys, we should all be doing that. We should all be doing croissant crawls through a new city, painting a plaster mug without caring what anybody thought of it, and belting out karaoke. This is truly a woman of many interests. Figuring out what we find fun and playful can be tricky, and we might not have quite as long of a list right now. But I think what we can feel like viscerally crystal clear on is what we don't find playful. And we sort of go, oh, I don't want to do that. 
A few weeks ago on social media, I asked people who follow me on Facebook, what to them is the opposite of play? Here are some of the words and phrases folks came up with. And there was a ton of them. It was like, it was incredible. Obligations, competition, discontent, limiting, creativity, drudgery, discord, joyless toil, perfectionism, work, compulsory, boring, passivity, when you can't be creative, coercion, anger, judgment. What stands out to you as you hear some of these words? You know what it makes me realize? What we find playful can't actually be defined by one specific task, rather by the surrounding attitudes and expectations we have internally or externally that are put on us. Maybe that's why we can find ourselves more exhausted by vacations or a day off than refreshed and renewed. I think if we can be honest with each other, we just met, but let's try it out. A lot of us don't know how to play. Or we think of what, what we do think of play is not actually playful or very helpful. I'm noticing when an activity or space makes a person feel limited in what they're able to do in any way, or an environment where people feel forced to do an activity, judged, held to standards of perfectionism, being watched. It lacks playfulness. It's toiling. Toiling in its many forms confines. It stifles us. It constricts. Toiling limits our imaginations to only what we've been told by the world is good and valuable about us because it benefits somebody else's bottom line. Toiling will feel like an impossible battle with the feeling of scarcity in all we do, work, relationships, and even rest. Hustle culture has taken over to the point where many people have to work long hours in at least one side gig to make ends meet or work towards their financial goals being met. Beyond that, part of the problem is that hustle culture is celebrated. Instead of taking stock of what it's costing us, we're praised for using all sorts of computers. I have at least three with me today. Busy has become a modern humble brag in a way. And busy is a weight we're just expected to carry and just accept. We've reduced the meaning of life to being productive in absolutely everything we do, and perhaps we even judge others by that same standard. Our bodies bear this cost too, so perhaps we have to heal through our body's engagement as well. Think back. Have you ever been on a vacation and felt that sting of competition or envy? Has vacation or, or entertainment involved such a big financial cost or time cost or energy cost that it brought on more stress for you and those around you. Like this thing better work out, it better go to plan or else. That pressure builds and builds until we end up with a migraine or GI issues or a back that was thrown out reaching for a tissue. It's me, I did that. Um, the pressure to have a good time all the time when rest is so precious creates that weight of obligations and perfectionism, and it's near impossible to rest when you have to be perfect at everything. Friends, I have yet to meet one person in my time at High Rock who isn't working hard at something or many things, mentally, emotionally, in your work. We're all working really hard, and playing hard is supposed to be that thing to help us combat that overwhelm of toiling away. But what happens when we don't actually play in a restorative way. Video games, super fun. But your day is ruined when you lose or it doesn't go your way. Baking, but overwhelmed with comparison and negative self-talk when it doesn't turn out perfect. Exercising, but being so disconnected from your body that you get injured from overdoing it. These good things can't be restorative when they're serving as distractions rather than ways to connect. When we just numb out or distract ourselves, we try to convince ourselves that the overwhelm is gone, and on paper, it looks like it should, it should be. I mean, we did do the thing, but we aren't more rested or restored. Or we could even be more frustrated than we started. So it isn't just that we're toiling away at our responsibilities, but we end up toiling away to unwind. 
Distractions can't build your resolve or offer meaningful perspective, connect you with your body, or engage your mind in a restorative way. Today, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not trying to make work the enemy. We will need to work at things in our life, whether at what we're working at is a career, a goal, a hobby. It's not necessarily what we are doing, but how and why we're going about our work and our rest. Our bodies and minds can be fixed in survival mode, dreaming, creative thinking, and imagination all become more constricted. That kind of constriction can be felt throughout us. If our rest or play is caught up in that same sort of toiling, we'll struggle to find that renewal we're looking for. We aren't really going to get what our body and minds want. Because we get caught up on Amazon Prime, guilty again. This is actually just a confession sermon for me. Because we're hoping that the next product, the next workout, the next purchase will fix us or fix that problem. But how long have any one of those actually satisfied before that nagging feeling of overwhelm returns? This year, there were many times my husband Scott over and over reminded me to email a friend to go stay in their spare room that they had offered so that I could get some time off and rest. I'm gonna guess how long it took me to actually schedule that? About six months. My supervisor even had to be like, you need to go away. You need to rest. You have vacation time. Use it. <sighs> I wanted a break, but it felt like so much more work to plan to figure out what was restful that I just kept putting it off. I know it sounds bananas. Let's look back at Genesis at our passage for today. We read, God bless them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every other living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Honestly, I wouldn't blame anyone who heard that and felt like, yeah, all God calls us to is work and trying to provide. So, of course, we're feeling like the work is never done. There's always more to do. And it's all overwhelming to be perfect all the time. But perhaps sin can also affect how we read scripture. We read the gift of stewarding creation as a burden and as a command. Then add in what God says after Adam and Eve eat off the fruit, eat off the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. Staying in Genesis, it says in chapter 3, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. Yikes, that really escalated quickly. We might read this as humanity screwed up and we're going to spend the rest of eternity just trying to, like, deal with the consequences from that. We might have been created for good, but then humanity fell and now this is our work, our sweat, our toil. Our identity becomes more informed by the fall than how we've been created by God. And friends, the part of the story we focus on is the part of the story we will reflect in the end. Perhaps the narrative of the fall has taken the place of the created goodness, and we've forgotten how to tell the whole story. The fall doesn't negate God's blessing over creation, yet perhaps part of the fall is that it makes us forgetful of who we really are. The reality is, like I said, work will be part of our lives, but it becomes problematic when it takes up our whole life. To quote an iconic horror movie, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. There was an entire movie around the concept of isolation and constant work and what it can do to a person. Hopefully no one can actually resonate with that. Didn't end well if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert. But perhaps you can relate to that dull feeling, finding it hard to find the motivation to show up and feeling like you can deal with what the day has ahead of you. You're doing the things on paper that you love, but you feel stuck. 
And perhaps maybe you feel this way about your spiritual life too, about prayer, about relating to God. As you listen today, maybe you feel stuck in a rut and can remember like a time that you felt connected to God. I know I've been in those spaces too. Maybe following Jesus is another thing in your life that feels like endless toil right now. But no matter what spiritual disciplines, prayers, books you read, there just isn't that same peace, joy, or hope there once was. And as adults, if we want to experience transformation, we could get a new outfit, a new hairstyle, new job, new spiritual practice, read a new book, take a class. Sure, those are all good things and can make different types of transformation possible, but remember those words that were the opposite of play we looked at earlier. It can be easy to make those good things that were once playful into spaces ruled by perfectionism. We want to get that workout perfect to get the perfect body. We want perfect spiritual practice or habit to feel like we're crushing it at following Jesus or take a new job or enroll in classes that totally align with our passion just to find ourselves back toiling in an obligation. That passion or hobby isn't fun anymore. And following Jesus could start to feel more like death than life or more like failure than thriving. That can be a hard place to be in. And it shouldn't be a place of shame. Play, friends, is an expression of freedom that we can feel throughout our bodies, our minds, and our spirit. When we enter into playfulness with an activity or in the way that we approach what we're doing, we're viscerally, viscerally reminded in our bodies that we are created good. We are created to know freedom because freely we were created by God, so freely we can play. Zephaniah declares this, the Lord your God is with you. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Friends, God didn't create us out of obligation or to prove anything. Creation itself, including us, including you, bears the playfulness of God. I think this is why Jesus often reminds us to welcome little children. Children play, they imagine, they wonder, and they create so freely. They laugh easily and unselfconsciously. Welcoming children into our worlds or into our spaces can interrupt our way of thinking, of being, of doing. Laughter is wonderfully contagious. However, maybe kids are a bridge too far for you. That's fine. So perhaps allow nature to interrupt your way of relating to the world around you. In creatures we see in forests, in playing under porches or near water sources. I'm just kidding. They, we'll get to that in a little bit. But creatures in our world are just as interesting to see. God didn't create just one creature to swim in the sea. There are millions God didn't create just one predator and one prey animal. There's so much variety. Okay, if you figured out those are Pokemon, you're right. See, being a little playful, see what I'm doing there? I know. And don't even get me going about the creativity we get to see in birds and insects. God said to rule over creation, not to perfectly control it, but to steward it with love. How incredible that we have such wonders to study, to ignite our curiosity and our imagination. The natural world, just like us or anything but static, it's always adapting and evolving. There's always something new to learn. Anyone else's mind blown by the images from the web, the web telescope this week? It was like unbelievable. Creation freely expands and creates new life. So this, too, invites us to playfully imagine new possibilities we haven't experienced before. There is hope in what is unseen. What suffering we see or endure might be real in this life, but we have other ways we can also engage that invite us to a different understanding. Seeing playfulness can lift our spirits. God wasn't just playful in the beginning like we read in Genesis. God is still playing in creation, and we are invited to do the same with God as an act of worship. So maybe hit the playground later as a continuation of your worship. 
creation is for delighting in, and we are, and you are delighted in. You are not the sum of your sins, for through Christ and through creation, you are called very good. In our experience of freedom, we remember that freely we were delightfully created by God, and in play we experience God's grace and reimagine God not as one who watches us, waiting for us to fail, but as a God who watches over us with abundant love. The need for this embodied reminder plays out across scripture too. David loved to dance and write music. The book of 2 Samuel tells us David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres and harps and tambourines, cassinets and cymbals, and Jesus was always at party. God loves a good time. So friends, what is the purpose of life? Okay, so I can't actually answer that for you. I think we have many purposes in our life and in our lifetime. What if you were resting? What if you could rest from the toiling of trying to find the one thing, the one thing you are most productive at, or the one thing the world is willing to value you by? Could you be more free to play, to try new things? Might you begin to relax? Can you dream of laugh lines around the corner of your mouth? Friends, toiling in our spiritual lives for an emotional high or a mountaintop feeling will have a significant impact on our spiritual life. It ends up functioning more like a bank account where we try to make good deposits of good and get rewards in return, and it's exhausting. And if that's what a life of faith is, my anxiety would be through the roof trying to keep my bank account with God in the red. When I feel this way, I've named it spiritual anxiety because it's not aligned with who I know God to be. It flags me to slow down and think about what's happening a little bit differently. I do a reality check. Is God love? Yes. Is this anxiety that I'm feeling what love would ask of me? Hard no. Is God's love or is God's love scarce or something I need to earn? Also. Definitively, no. But undoing that narrative can be challenging because we've, but we've been given our bodies as an invitation to playfulness. They can be a reminder to reclaim the narrative of our goodness. As we learn to listen, we can actually respond. We'll always have things to do, and toil is ready to keep us captive to the false self-satisfaction of keeping busy all the time. And all of these when they become places of toil, it can feel like being pulled out to sea by a riptide. You have to exert all the energy you have, but you find yourself worse off, exhausted, just trying to survive. The only way out of a riptide is counterintuitive. You actually have to stop fighting against it and swim parallel to the shore. The tricky part is getting out of survival mode long enough to remember that trick so you can get back to playing at the beach. If you, like me, wondered where in your pack schedule you could possibly fit play, then you're a great place to begin exploring. It takes a lifetime, and that's fine. Play isn't something separate from our lives. It's something we can fold into it. It's a way that we can bring light into the darkness that toiling could never. There's a scene in Ted Lasso that illustrates this phenomenon really pointedly. Isaac McAdoo has taken over as the team captain with big shoes to fill. As the legendary veteran player, Roy Kent, has just retired, Isaac has a ton of pressure on his shoulders. This new responsibility has changed where his head's at and how he plays on the field, costing them really important games. And the former captain, Roy Kent, steps in to bring Isaac to a pickup game in the city. He plays alongside peers who are simply playing for the love of the game. And he's reminded what it's like not just to play soccer, but to play at soccer without the pressure of judgment or a paycheck or the fear of failure. And he plays the rest of the game with this new exuberance and confidence. And he reconnects with this natural talent that he has, that he remembers in his body from his childhood when he loved the game. It's, a new, it's the same game that he returns to 
but he's different. And it's infectious, and his teammates play differently. And I think this is where we can relate to his story. What was once playful and freeing can become endless toil. So how do we find ourselves at play again? Play is within our DNA that our creator made us for. Our bodies want to laugh and be joyful. Play, friends, play refuses to engage with the patterns of the world and can offer us a pathway to restoration. Here's one way that I strategically practice bringing play into my day. I'm a person who likes structure and rules because then I can decide what boundaries I want to push or even reject. Okay, rebelling even against my own rules that I set is actually a little bit fun for me. Um, I know. It creates a space where there's some safety with those boundaries, but also freedom to push them as needed. I dusted off an old drawing set with um, just some black and white charcoal. So the boundary there was just a limited color palette. Next, what would I draw? I had to decide an apple. The boundary was a limited subject. Finally, to address that pesky desire and momentum towards perfectionism, the purpose of the time wasn't to produce something Instagrammable. And I actually have to tell myself, I will not share this image of whatever I created and, um, because that would have totally gotten to my head. But I felt more free because nobody else was going to see it. So I sat down with those boundaries for three minutes to draw an apple. I set a timer with only black and white color values, and it was great. It was only three minutes. I drew the apple and tapped into a different part of myself that was free just to create something on paper for a little bit. And after that, I noticed my approach to my responsibilities and work was a little bit lighter. My perspective was different. I engaged with my, my kids differently. Creating spaces where we are all a little freer from the pressure to perform and to quote the renowned professor Valerie Frizzle, PhD. We need to take chances. We need to make mistakes and we need to get messy. It's clear that we are working hard, but we're not playing hard or perhaps we're toiling away too much trying to relax. We're burning out and checking out in the back to work and friends, this is not a pattern we can sustain mentally, emotionally, or physically. We're made for so much more than toil. We are created in the image of God. In the image of God, you're created. Yes, it's so important that I'm saying it twice, and scripture does that too. We bear the divine likeness of God in our bodies when we laugh, in the way our minds work. I know many people who say that they need a good cry, and in this season, Given all that's going on, I think I need a good laugh, too. Perhaps we need to connect back to what it feels like to get lost in the flow or something we love. And maybe with somebody we love. I know for me, in this journey, and you are, this is offered to you as well, I've needed to go to prayer in this process to not try to perfect it. And I've been praying, God, teach me again how to play. Let me not take myself too seriously or be so afraid of messing up that I don't try something new. Put in my path people who are better at play than I am so I can learn from them. Friends, engaging in play takes a stance against fear. Engaging a play in play is defiance against how the world wants to value you. It's actively and joyfully agreeing with God that yes, I bear your image. I bear your own creativity. I will delight in being loved. It's to agree that you are worthy of joy, not just as an intellectual act exercise, but an embodied agreement that can lift our souls back from the depths to remember the lightness and joy of following Jesus. Play confronts the lies sin tells us with light and joy and truth, all without fear. When we play, we have to face the fear of what someone will think when I'm dancing in the car on my way over here to try to practice literally what I'm preaching. We have to face the reality we might not perform perfectly or have some impressive product to show for it. It will be a bit uncomfortable and a bit awkward, but practice makes better. We become friends with play again and bold in our refusal to forget who we are in Christ. 
Friends, we need each other to remember. We need community to be on the journey with us to inspire us when we've forgotten how to play. We'll need reminders to each other that we're not created for toil, but we're divinely created in our very bones and experience that freedom in life. There's been a side of TikTok that's been refreshing the window into how people have found ways to play. I saw a woman build a community around her commitment to dance every day, regardless of weather, in defiance of her depression. At a time when I was overwhelmed, having a playful posture meant watching others figure out how to play. So I can remember I did too. My friend Kayla is a regular performer with an improv group for the sake of being intentionally playful and creative. She shared with me how what she learns about herself and others in that space transforms how she thinks about hospitality and preaching and theology and how she shows up in the world. Friends, a playful posture is something we can intentionally cultivate. Signing up for a class or watching YouTube to try a new hobby, not to master it, but just to do it. Playing baseball on a league, looking out a window, prayerfully watching for playfulness as it might happen by. Tinkering with things, writing, dancing, singing, getting playful pants, just trying things and being willing to experiment. Make a really color-coded spreadsheet about all your playful experiences. If color-coding spreadsheets is playful for you, then go for it. Learn a new hobby over Zoom. Play can be spontaneous, friends. It can be planned. But play isn't one size fits all. It will reflect you. And it will reflect how you experience freedom. But it is longing to come out and offer you this embodied reminder that there is hope, that you are a new creation. There is more possible than what we know of our world and ourselves today. God created us. God created you playfully. And as we try on playfulness, we can create a new future, remembering with God that God's yoke is easy and God's burden is light. Would you pray with me? God, I pray that you would give us boldness in our belief that we are created good. God, let us not compare ourselves to others in what we find playful. May we delight in what interests us, for we interest you. God, I pray that there would be a mutuality of joy as we are on this journey to reconnect with playfulness. God, thank you that you are with us, that we are your created and beloved creatures. God, you are good, and you are delightful, and we delight in you. Amen. We serve a very creative God and a playful God. Um, I was so glad that Pastor Abby showed a picture of an axolotl up on the screen. And if you guys don't know what that is, you should look it up because it is a literal real-life Pokemon. Um, but a God who creates such beautiful and fun animals and a beautiful sky, an incredible galaxy filled of, an uh, incredible universe filled with galaxies of billions and billions of stars. We serve that God. So let's stand and worship him for that this morning. Stop. 
Church, you may be seated. Can we, uh, can we put our hands together to thank Pastor Abby for being here with us today? Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking about all the ways that, as, as she was speaking, I was thinking of all the ways that my, uh, my son reminds me to play and the different kind of aspects of play. Um, I recently tried to decorate our, our, redo our porch and I switched on the porch lights for the first time and he just went, that's incredible. And at first I was like, well, thank you. I spent a lot of time in the city putting up those porch lights. But I had the same reaction. I realized I had the same reaction when, when um, looking at the images from the telescope, just going, that's incredible. And how close the sense of wonder is the sense of worship, of saying, that's incredible. And, oh, God, you are so incredible. And the world is so much bigger and beautiful than I can ever imagine that's incredible. So there's wonder there. There's, there's storytelling that my, when my son like lays out his Thomas the Train tank engines and I don't know, they all run into some adventures. I'm like, oh, there's a sense of storytelling that we go through too as we play. And God has created us to be people of stories as well. And sometimes it's creativity of building things and of knocking things down, yes. Um, but I'm like, that also reflects who God is and it invites all of these things, whether it's wonder or um, creativity or storytelling or whatever have you. And, and we, we heard a little bit of the, all the ways that we play. It's ways that we can also, we're invited to engage in, in worship, in reflecting, um, Reflecting a playful God, reflecting how God has made us to be playful. And so um, if you have any prayer requests, even if the prayer request is, Lord, make me more playful. Well, Lord, give me space to play. Lord, bring people in my life, as Abby said, that will help me, will remind me to play. Um, I invite you to write them down on a post-it and stick them to one of the posters on the wall because we get to, I, I love being able to pray for you over the course of the week. Um, so I invite you to, to leave prayers or thanksgiving uh, on the poster papers if you have them. Um, if you are new with us today, I, I would love to meet you. I'm, and a few others will be up here to get to know you, to answer any questions you might have. I encourage you to also stay connected with other members of the community. Fill out a connection card if you haven't yet. Um, but thank you so much for blessing us with your thoughtfulness and openness with us. We get, to, we get to wrestle with this together. We get to talk about this together because, um, because God has called us not to do this alone, but with each other. Uh, if, you are, if you are new uh, and, and if you don't mind hanging around and if you're looking for somewhere for lunch, some of us uh, do go out for lunch and grab lunch together um, outside uh, after the service. So stick around if you want to make lunch plans with us. But as Abby said, our worship doesn't end here just because this service ends. But we are invited to continue in worship. I think you said, like, go to the playground as an extension of your worship. Yeah, go to the playground as an extension of your worship. Go bring um, that playfulness that you were created with, the playfulness of God with you. Um, it's a way to reflect the God that we love, the God who loves us. So we are sent out with the presence of God in the Holy Spirit, and we worship the Lord in how we live and how we love and how we play outside of these walls. Uh, so church, hear this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord.